Good evening. We will now begin the webinar. Today is September 30th, 2021, and the time is 6.04 p.m. This webinar is being livecasted and recorded and will be available publicly on the MTA YouTube channel and the Central Business District Tolling Program project website at new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP. By attending this virtual webinar, you are consenting to be recorded. Today's webinar will begin with opening remarks followed by a presentation on the Central Business District Tolling Program and then public comments. Please note that each speaker will be limited to two minutes. There are a large number of speakers signed up this evening, and in the interest of time and respect for all other speakers, we ask that speakers keep their remarks to the two-minute time frame. Only those who signed up to speak in advance will be able to give public comments. If you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function with the name you used when you signed up. If you did not sign up to speak at today's webinar, you may sign up to speak at an upcoming webinar. To do so, please visit new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP or call the public meeting hotline at 646-252-6777. Anyone who joined the Zoom may also use the Q&A function throughout today's webinar to ask questions or provide comments. Cart captioning and American Sign Language interpreters are available at today's webinar. We will now start with opening remarks from Dr. Allison Desireño, MTA's Deputy Chief Operating Officer. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us this evening. We're very excited to be engaging in public outreach for this historic project. And we thank you for taking the time to learn more and to share with us your thoughts and comments this evening. Joining me are colleagues from New York State Department of Transportation and New York City Department of Transportation, as well as from the Federal Highway Administration, the lead agency for the project. We also have several individuals from our respective staffs here with us to listen to what you have to say. Your comments will be indexed and considered as part of the environmental assessment process. With that, let's jump right in as there's a lot to cover. Our agenda for today is to review the proposed program, the project purpose and need, discuss the project alternatives, provide an overview of the environmental assessment, and discuss and describe environmental justice considerations. We'll take a few moments to talk about the potential project effects and benefits, and then have a public comment session. So how did we get here? There's been a decade of congestion. Congestion in New York City has consistently ranked among the worst in the United States. Local bus speeds in Manhattan are on average 7% slower than citywide speeds. Between 2010 and 2018, travel speeds decreased by 23% in Manhattan's Central Business District, or CBD. And during that same period, multiple studies and panels explored how best to address congestion, including the 2008 New York City Traffic Congestion Mitigation Commission and the 2018 Fixed New York City Advisory Panel. Many of them came back with the same concept of congestion pricing. There is also a need for sustainable funding source for transit. Prior to the pandemic, nearly 75% of trips into the Manhattan Central Business District were made using transit. 95% of trips to the Manhattan Central Business District by low income populations are made using transit. MTA's subway system is over 100 years old and must be repaired and modernized to meet the region's needs. And funding transit modernization would improve service and attract commuters back to the system, further reducing congestion. In April 2019, the New York State Legislature passed the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act. If approved by the Federal Highway Administration, this act would entail vehicles entering or remaining in the Manhattan Central Business District be tolled. Net revenues would be used for public transportation capital projects, with 80% devoted to New York City Transit, 10% to the Long Island Railroad, and 10% to Metro North. The toll rates will be determined by the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, or TBTA Board informed by recommendations of the Traffic Mobility Review Board and after a public hearing. There are mandatory post-implementation reporting and evaluation requirements. Make sure everyone understands the area about which we're speaking. Central Business District Tolling Program Boundary 
is south of and inclusive of 60th Street. Tolls would not apply to vehicles that are solely using the FDR Drive, Route 9A West Side Highway, including connections to the UL Carry Tunnel, or the Battery Park underpass connecting the FDR Drive and Route 9A. Federal mm -hmm. Highway Administration will serve as the federal lead agency for environmental review. They are responsible for reviewing all of our analyses to confirm that they are complete, and they will also issue the environmental findings for the project. The Metropolitan Transportation Authority and its affiliate, the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, the New York State Department of Transportation, and the New York City Department of Transportation are serving as project sponsors. With respect to the project purpose and need, the project purpose is to reduce traffic congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District in a manner that will generate revenue for future transportation improvements pursuant to acceptance into the FHWA's Value Pricing Pilot Program, or VPPP. The project would address the following needs. Reduce vehicle congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District and create a new local recurring funding source for MTA's capital projects. The following objectives further refine the project purpose. It would reduce daily vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, within the Manhattan Central Business District. Reduce the number of vehicles entering the Manhattan Central Business District each day. Create a funding source for capital improvements and generate sufficient annual net revenue to fund $15 billion for capital projects for the MTA Capital Program. And establish a tolling program consistent with the purposes underlying the New York State legislation entitled the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act. So how is the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and the project linked? NEPA requires federal agencies to assess and consider the environmental effects of their proposed actions prior to making a decision. The project would be implemented through the Federal Highway Administration's VPPP. As a federal program, that VPPP, or Value Pricing Pilot Program, is subject to NEPA. Federal Highway administration is the lead agency and has determined that an environmental assessment with extensive outreach is the appropriate level of environmental documentation for this project. There are two project alternatives. There's the no action. There would be no central business district tolling program, no comprehensive plan to reduce congestion in the central business district, and no identified transit capital revenue stream. And there is the build or act alternative, where we would build a central business district tolling program. There would be new tolling infrastructure and toll system equipment, implementation of a tolling program, which would have multiple scenarios in the environmental assessment to assess and identify the range of effects, positive or negative. And there would be creation of a new revenue stream for investment in subways, buses, and rail. A little more detail on the proposed central business district tolling program alternative. As noted earlier, tolls would be charged for vehicles entering Manhattan south of and inclusive of 60th Street. Passenger vehicles would be charged once per day, and there are exemptions required by the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act for qualifying vehicles transporting persons with disabilities, qualifying authorized emergency vehicles. Central business district residents with gross adjusted incomes below 60,000 would be eligible for a tax credit. And there would be a traffic mobility review board that would be tasked with recommending to the TBTA board the toll structure, including but not limited to a plan for credits, discounts, and or exemptions. Recommendations will be informed by a traffic study and must take into account multiple criteria, including the ability to generate revenue required, the impact on traffic patterns and volumes, public safety, air quality, among others. With respect to the toll, the environmental assessment is going to assess a range of scenarios and will be informed by robust public outreach. Studying multiple scenarios ensures that we understand the full range of potential environmental effects, including but not limited to congestion reduction that different toll rates may cause. Toll rates will differ in each scenario depending upon the time of day, how someone pays, and the inclusion and extent of any credits, discounts, and or exemptions beyond the two mandated by the enabling state legislation. Importantly, all else being equal, the more credits, discounts, and or exemptions that are given, the higher the toll must be in order to meet the project's purpose, needs, and objectives. The modeling is not complete, and a final determination of the toll rates will not be made in the environmental assessment. Indeed, the toll rates, as noted previously, will ultimately be set by a vote of the TBTA board after the environmental review process and after the Traffic Mobility Review Board makes its recommendations. So importantly, these numbers I am about to share are for informational purposes and subject to change. With that said, to give you at least a sense of the range of potential toll rates, we anticipate that the easy pass peak period toll for automobiles will range from roughly $9 on the lower end 
to $23 on the higher end if many credits, exemptions, and or discounts are provided. The range of potential toll rates for automobiles using tolls by mail would be higher, roughly $14 to $35 for the peak period, again, depending upon scenario. Off-peak and overnight toll ranges may be lower, and tolls for trucks and other vehicle types would have different ranges. With respect to the study areas, the broad study area for the environmental assessment includes a region of 28 counties throughout New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. There will also be more refined local study areas, including the Central Business District, as defined by the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act, in other words, 60th Street and Inclusive and South, with those other areas excluded, as we described earlier, and neighborhoods near the Central Business District boundary where the project could have social, economic, or environmental effects. In terms of the key topics of the environmental assessment, this is not the full list, but we wanted to at least give you some sense of the kinds of things we'll be studying. Among them, as you can see, regional transportation, which is obvious, will be looking at highways and local intersections, commuter rail, subways, and buses, parking and pedestrian and bicyclists. We'll also be looking at social and economic considerations and conditions. We'll be looking at the visual resources, air quality, noise, and environmental justice, among others. Environmental justice is an important consideration for the project. Given that over 51% of the population within our study area lives in environmental justice communities, we're going to spend some time walking you through the federal requirements to address environmental justice and some of the tools we'll be using to engage with environmental justice communities. The term environmental justice refers collectively to minority and low-income populations within a project study area. In 1994, President Clinton issued Executive Order 12898, which requires federal agencies to consider the effects of their actions on environmental justice communities. In subsequent years, the U.S. Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration have issued their own orders on environmental justice. Our environmental assessment must comply with all of these orders. The orders provide that Federal Highway Administration take the appropriate and necessary steps to identify and address disproportionately high and adverse effects of federal projects on the health or environment of minority and low-income populations to the greatest extent practicable and permitted by law. This slide shows the steps we'll be using in developing our environmental justice analysis. It is based on guidance developed by Federal Highway Administration and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. As you can see, we begin by identifying minority and low income or environmental justice populations and environmental justice communities. We engage in outreach with those communities, as you can see by the little picture on the right. We then determine whether the project would result in adverse effects on environmental justice populations or communities. We consider mitigations for those adverse effects of the project, as well as potentially offsetting benefits to the affected environmental justice populations. Again, there is outreach and engagement during that process. If the effects remain adverse after mitigation, we identify disproportionately high and adverse effects. If there are no disproportionately high and adverse effects, the evaluation is complete. If there are disproportionately high and adverse effects, we evaluate further mitigations or alternatives to avoid or reduce those effects. The Federal Highway Administration Environmental Justice Order provides specific definitions for minority and low income populations. As you can see here, minority is defined by U.S. Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration as a person who identifies as Black, Hispanic, or Latino, Asian or Asian American, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander, or individuals identified as some other race by the U.S. Census. Low income is defined by United States Department of Transportation and Federal Highway Administration as a person whose household income is at or below the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services poverty guidelines. For a family of four, the 2018 U.S. Census Bureau poverty threshold was $25,750 for the study area. Based on the definitions in the previous slide, we have identified the environmental justice populations in our 28 county study area. As noted earlier, and as you can see in this table, over 51% of our study area population is considered minority and over 13% is considered low income. This map shows the distribution of environmental justice populations throughout our study area. The map shows large concentrations of environmental justice populations in New York City and the immediately surrounding suburbs. There are also large concentrations of environmental justice populations throughout our study area. Our public outreach will engage with these communities as much as possible. 
One way we'll be engaging with the communities is through the creation of an environmental justice technical advisory group. This is a group of technical experts who have knowledge of environmental justice considerations and can share concerns drawn from throughout the study area. The group is comprised of community leaders, advocacy group representatives, and industry group representatives with specific interest in environmental justice considerations. Their purpose will be to identify concerns and mitigation if needed and help to ensure information is circulated as widely as possible to the larger communities. The technical advisory group will be by invitation only, and we anticipate the first meeting convening in early October of 2021. Potential participants will be contacted in advance. We will also be creating an environmental justice stakeholder working group. This is a group of interested members of the communities throughout the study area who would also like to participate beyond submitting comments or participating in the webinars. This group will be comprised of interested members of the community, and the purpose is to share concerns and request discussion on particular issues as appropriate. To suggest yourself or someone else, you may visit our website, or you may com to complete a form, or you can contact us by phone at 646-252-7440. We anticipate that the first meeting of this group will be convened in early November of 2021. And again, once we have all the names and contact information, participants will be contacted in advance. We're gonna review some of the potential effects of the project. Importantly, these effects are dependent upon scenario. The next slide will highlight some of the potential benefits, but I'll take a few moments to talk through the bullets here. We anticipate that there may be effects where there would be new tolling infrastructure and equipment, that there might be changes in traffic in neighborhoods near the Manhattan Central Business District, and that there might be traffic that diverts around the Manhattan Central Business District to avoid tolls. Again, dependent upon scenario. Near the Queens Midtown Tunnel and the Hewell Carry Tunnel, we anticipate some traffic diversions on the highway system that could result in more than a nominal increase in traffic. Preliminary analysis suggests this change in traffic would not occur on local roadways and would not adversely impact air quality or noise in the neighborhoods where the highways are located. However, we will be looking more closely at the neighborhoods adjacent to both sides of these tunnels. Some drivers currently travel through Manhattan, although their destination is elsewhere. For example, you may travel from New Jersey to Brooklyn or the Bronx by going through Manhattan. Preliminary modeling indicates that some of these drivers may change their routes and traffic may increase in certain locations depending upon scenario. We will be looking more closely at the extent of those increases in parts of Staten Island, Brooklyn, Upper Manhattan, and the Bronx, and whether they could result in notable changes in traffic, air quality, or noise. Preliminary analysis also indicates that new transit passengers who may take transit rather than drive will be spread throughout the transit system and will not overcrowd any particular route or line. Based on preliminary analysis, the shift to transit would not notably change access to transit, transit services, or pedestrian circulation near transit stations and hubs. In terms of tolls on low-income and minority populations coming to the Central Business District from throughout the region, a direct effect of the project on residents of the Manhattan Central Business District who are part of an environmental justice population is that they will be charged a toll to drive into the Central Business District. However, the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act provides a tax credit for those individuals whose primary residence is within the Central Business District and whose New York adjusted gross income is less than 60,000 per year. Preliminary analysis has found that fewer than 1% of the Manhattan Central Business District's commuters are low-income individuals who drive, but nonetheless, we are assessing the economic effects of the additional costs for these customers. Tolls on the taxi or for hire vehicle industry, which has a high proportion of workers who identify as minority, as defined by United States Department of Transportation guidance, are also being looked at. Industry data shows that a high percentage of taxi or for hire vehicle drivers identify as belonging to a minority population. Once there is a new toll for entering the Manhattan Central Business District, some passengers may no longer choose to use taxis and for hire vehicles. We will examine the effect of the project on the taxi or for hire vehicle industry and the resultant effect on minority drivers. With respect to potential project benefits, if approved, we anticipate the project would reduce vehicular traffic in and near the Manhattan Central Business District. Overall, and depending upon scenario, our models predict a 15 to 20 percent reduction in traffic volumes that would enter the Manhattan Central Business District each day. As a result, we would see improvements in air quality and traffic noise as there would be fewer vehicles. We also anticipate improvements in travel times within the Manhattan Central Business District, again, as there would be less congestion. And of course, the project would provide additional funds for subways, trains, and buses, 
funding the MTA capital program, which includes many projects to improve and expand subway, bus, and commuter rail service. This would benefit MTA's transit commuters, including environmental justice populations. I want to take just a moment to discuss or describe the anticipated NEPA schedule. We've already begun our outreach. That's what we're doing here today. And we anticipate that this outreach will continue through January of 2022, as we also prepare the NEPA environmental assessment. Between February 2022 and May 22, 2022, there will be review with Federal Highway Administration of the document itself. And at the end of that period, the environmental assessment will be made available for public comment. Once the document is made available for public comment, there will be a public review period and a new comment period. That period will also include additional outreach related to toll rate ranges. Between that June 2022 date and December 2022, the work will be done to incorporate all of that information to make sure that the final outreach is done and ultimately to have Federal Highway Administration make an environmental determination. If approved by Federal Highway Administration, Future outreach and public hearings will be held as part of the implementation and traffic mobility review board process during 2023. Here is the list of all the public outreach webinars we are holding. As had been noted in the distribution materials prior, you may attend any one of these or all of these as you would like. We also have the three environmental justice outreach meetings. Webinars, those will be occurring on October 7th, 12th, and 13th with slightly different focus areas. But again, as with the public outreach meetings, residents may attend any one of the webinars they would like to. In terms of our stakeholder working group meetings, we expect the first one in early November, the second one in late November, and then we expect a third one in June of 2022 once the environmental assessment has been released for public review. Thank you. We will now move to the public comment portion of today's webinar. We encourage anyone joining via Zoom or live stream to take a short survey using the QR code or link currently being displayed. The link can also be found in the Q&A section of the Zoom. We are gathering public comments today to inform the environmental review process. Comments will be reflected in the environmental assessment once it is made public. Rather than responding to comments as they are given, we will do our best to address specific questions whenever possible in the Q&A chat function. However, please understand that at this phase of the process, your question may be one that cannot be answered meaningfully until completion of the modeling and analysis. Anyone who joined the Zoom may also use the Q&A function throughout today's webinar to ask questions or provide comments. Please note that each speaker is limited to two minutes. We ask that speakers keep their remarks to the two minute time frame out of respect for all other speakers. We will be calling speakers who live in the geographic area that is the focus of today's webinar first in the order they signed up. Due to the large number of speakers, we may go over our scheduled time, but everyone who signed up will be called to speak today. If you do not want to wait to be called, you may send us comments directly or sign up to speak at one of our upcoming webinars. For more details, please visit our website at new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP, post in the Q&A function on Zoom, or call the public meeting hotline at 646-252-6777. Current captioning and American Sign Language interpreters are available at today's webinar. Spanish and Russian interpreters are also available for those who requested them in advance. Only those who signed up to speak in advance will be able to give public comments. If you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function with the name you used when you signed up. When you're called on to speak, there will be a brief transition on your screen. Please make sure that once your screen updates, your camera and microphone are enabled before beginning your remarks. You will not be able to unmute or enable your camera until it is your turn to speak. Please remain patient until then. In the event you miss your name being called, we will call the list one more time after all speakers in attendance have been called the first time. As a reminder, this webinar is being live casted and recorded and will be available publicly on our YouTube channel and our project website. By attending this virtual webinar, you are consenting to be recorded. 
We will now begin the, com the public comment portion of today's webinar. Our first speaker is Assembly Member Stacy Pfefferamato, followed by Andy Pollack. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I would like to thank the MTA for hosting this event. It is very important that myself, other elected officials, and of course, the public are able to speak on this issue. My name is Stacey Pfeffer Amato, and I'm the New York State Assemblywoman who represents the 23rd Assembly District. And I've been talking about for years about toll equity, because in my district, we have the only intraborough bridge in New York State, the Cross Bay Veterans Memorial Bridge. This bridge goes from one part of Queens through another. Matter of fact, it cuts right in the middle of my assembly district. So people in the north of my district who want to come south must pay a toll. It connects the Rockway Peninsula to the mainland of Queens. It was built in 1939 and then expanded in 1970. When the Cross Bay Bridge was first constructed, the toll was only 10 cents a trip and designed only to cover the cost of building and building new improvements. However, the cost of the bridge now is $4.25. This is a huge deterrent in, the air, in my area, which allows residents, um, it stops residents from visiting our public beaches, but most importantly, again, the residents in the north of my district, less than five miles, must pay a toll to go to the public hospital, public beaches, churches, synagogues, and public school, and most importantly, to go to work. If we're going to discuss toll equity, we're going to talk about, talk about creating a new funding source like the Central Business District. Then we should also commit to this fully and eliminate the toll on the Cross Bay Bridge for once and for all. Thank you for this time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Pollack, followed by Andreas Piedrahita. Andy? Good evening. I like to give comments regarding congestion pricing. So first things first, this has to be done as quickly as possible because the traffic is getting worse and worse by the day. I particularly notice it a lot, even in the outer boroughs. The Long Island Expressway and Grand Central Parkway, numerous examples I can give. Also, main roads like Francis Lewis Boulevard, where the Q76, for an example, gets stuck in traffic. Jamaica Avenue, for another example, where the Q30, Q31 gets stuck in traffic. This idea of implementing congestion pricing in Manhattan is the start. But afterwards, what we need to evaluate is looking at congestion pricing for other areas of the five boroughs outside of Manhattan, where you see a lot of congestion. I can go on and on and on on numerous examples, but I just gave examples for Queens just to prove a point. So I will mention that I did speak in favor of congestion pricing at the July MTA Finance Committee meeting. I will mention that we are now the worst traffic city in the whole country. You can look at Texas A&M, we beat Los Angeles. That's very alarming. So we have to get this done as quickly as possible. The traffic is getting worse day by day. Congestion pricing must be done now. So thank you all very much for letting me speak to you this evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andreas Pindrahita, followed by George Bettman. Andreas?
Andreas Pedrahita. We'll move to our next speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we able to hear Andreas Pedrahita? We will move on to our next speaker, George Bettman, followed by Cheryl Stewart. George Bettman? Yes, my name is George Bettman, and I am a Riders Alliance member from Brooklyn. I am here to testify for the need to implement congestion pricing as soon as possible. Fares continue to go up with no noticeable improvement in service. This is in good part after years of divestment, our bus and subway system needs so much work on its infrastructure, such as an improved signaling system for the subways, track maintenance, and the installation of escalators and elevators so people with disabilities can access the buses and subways. A modern signal system will allow trains to run on time, eliminating a lot of the delays that riders now experience. There are also a large number of riders, including myself, that depend on escalators and elevators to get around the subway system. We often walk far distances and travel way out of our way just to find one of the few accessible stations, only to find out that the elevator is broken. If I find an elevator that's broken that does not work, I am forced to use the stairs, and it takes me forever to get to the platform because I have to take one step at a time. Because of this, I miss my train. I have the same problem going up the stairs, and a lot of people behind me get pissed off because I am so slow. I have to take one step at a time, and as I said, the people are in, behind me are in the rush. They want to get around me, and they can't do so. We need to do better at now, and that means investing in our transit system. An increase in fares does not cover the cost of the necessary improvements. The riding public can contribute only so much for improvements. That is why I am here today to get the necessary funding to get the infrastructure changes made and to improve bus and subway service. The money that congestion pricing will bring in will do so much to improve our transit system. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cheryl Stewart, followed by Susan Laser. Cheryl, can you hear me now? We can. Yes. Uh, can you see me? I. Uh, Your camera is currently off. Uh, there I am. Thank you. Uh, I'm Cheryl Stewart, representing Riders Against Congestion. I'm a co-founder of the New York Motorcycle and Scooter Task Force and a founding member of the Sirens Women's Motorcycle Club. In addition, I serve on the Motorcycle Advisory Council convened by New York City DOT to work on motorcycle safety issues. I'm a professional freelance artist. I live in Red Hook, Brooklyn, which is a neighborhood poorly served by public transportation. Many of my workdays find me transporting my sculpture tools, which uh, reciprocal saws, chisels, mallets, keyhole saws, giant calipers. Even if I had access to a subway in Red Hook, I would still need to use a private vehicle to transport myself and my tools to work. My coworkers load up their giant pickup trucks. I strap my tools on the back of my fuel efficient congestion reducing motorcycle. The primary goal as stated here of congestion pricing is reducing New York City's notorious traffic. Our small lightweight vehicles have an outsized effect reducing traffic congestion. In fact, Sam Schwartz himself authored a report in 2008 demonstrating that even a small mode shift away from autos and towards motorbikes would result in enormous decreases in traffic delays and a commensurate reduction in CO2 emissions. Motorcycles are granted a 100% exemption from congestion-based tolling in London, as well as in Stockholm, Milan, the entire country of Germany, and every European city where congestion pricing has been successfully imposed. Incentivizing motorcycles is part of their congestion reduction strategy. Danny Harris, Executive Director of Transportation Alternatives, has said that Transalt wants New York City to adopt the London Congestion Pricing Plan in its entirety. We agree. As they do in London, the remarks. grant motorcycles a 100% exemption from congestion-based tolling as a part of the congestion reduction strategy. Our next speaker is Susan Laser, followed by Anuranjan Pegu. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Susan Lazar and I'm a resident at Brooklyn for 33 years. I'm a wife and a mother. I'm also a pledge to the Sirens Women's Motorcycle Club of New York City. In 2018, I needed to take employment with the company located in Weehawken, New Jersey. Commuting by public transportation is not a viable option. At an absolute minimum, public transportation, no matter what route I took, is two hours in one direction. That's four hours a day by public transportation at a cost of $23.50 a day, along with walking over two miles taking two subway trains, as well as a ferry boat. This takes valuable time away from my family and my life. So three years ago at age 50, I got my motorcycle license and I drove my motorcycle to work. This has been able to reduce my commute time down to three hours a day. I still pay tolls of $17 a day, having no other way to cross than either the Lincoln or the Holland Tunnel and I'm very concerned by the map I see and how this is going to affect me. If motorcycles are not exempt, my tolls will be more than $30 a day just to get to my job. Although my motorcycle riding started out for my personal time and cost savings, I realized that I was benefiting the city that I love so much. I use far less gas and take up far less space than one car. I reduce the weight on our bridges. I am reducing congestion and reducing pollution from idling vehicles. If motorcycles are not exempt from congestion pricing, I will be being punished by this city for doing what is right. London understands the benefit that motorcycles bring over cars and supports them with a 100% exemption. I ask that New York City do the same. Please give motorcycles a 100% exemption. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Anuranjan Pegu, followed by Sandra Fleming. Anuranjan? Yes. Hi. We can uh, hear you. Good evening. My name is Anuranjan Pegu. I work at an environmental nonprofit and have been involved with environmental and social justice issues for many years. I've always supported congestion pricing in other cities wherever there is congestion pricing for environmental reasons. And I feel that this tolling program should be more sincere when it comes to environment and social equ uh, equity. This plan is inspired by other congestion pricing systems of the world where uh, it has been proven to be successful in reducing congestion and pollution. And that is why we should follow those models very closely. And one thing that these have in common, all the systems that exist, is the 100% exemption that they give to motorcycles. Why did they do that? Many people have already talked about the lower carbon dioxide emissions, the great fuel economy, the less wear and tear on roadways, the ability to park six motorcycles in one parking spot, and of course, the ability to reduce congestion. It is a scientific, logical, proven, and common sense idea. In London, even in the ultra low emission zone, motorcycles, made after 2007 are still 100% exempted from that toll. The other big thing that existing plans also take into factor is uh, social equity. Motorcycles are cheap, affordable means of transportation for a lot of middle and lower income people, especially for those who cannot afford to live in downtown areas. Cars or home public transport does not work. I live south of Prospect Park. It takes me about 60 minutes to get to my work in Flatiron District, but on a motorcycle, it can take 30 minutes. The same for many of the people who live south of where I do. Um, so basically, it makes it, motorcycles are more affordable, accessible, and easily adoptable than let's say bicycles. We, I, it would take me much more longer and I'd be tired getting to work on a bicycle and trains are always delayed around where I live. Um, to sum up, congestion pricing everywhere in the Western world gives 100% exemption to motorcycles because motorcycles have been proven to reduce congestion and pollution while bringing social equity. And I hope that the MTA is serious about doing uh, getting those two aims because it is a very common Please sense and the right remarks. thing to do. Yes, thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Sandra Fleming, followed by Kristen O'Reilly. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Sandra Fleming. I am a social worker and motorcycle rider. I use my motorcycle to visit four to six patients daily. I'm required by the agency that I work for, which is a home care visiting agency, to use a vehicle of not public transportation because we would not be able to see enough patients. I often do areas where there is no parking. The only option has been to use the motorcycle to be as efficient as possible. Not only efficient to park, but also we I am sincerely congestion reducing. I too attempted to use a bicycle to commute, but it was too slow and I would I would arrive sweaty and too exhausted to do my job efficiently. I see that the city has gone to extreme efforts to support non-motorized vehicles, meaning uh, two-wheeled vehicles, meaning bicycles. There are lanes all over the place. We take not much more footprint than a bicycle. So it's unreasonable to believe that we would not be afforded the same luxury, the same, the same uh, benefits uh, given that we are so congestion reducing. So I too call for 100% exemption from congestion pricing for motorcyclists. Anyone riding a vehicle that is not contributing to the problem should not be taxed for the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kristen O'Reilly, followed by John Cho. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm so sorry. I'm here. I will start talking in one second. Okay. 
I can't see my notes anymore, but here we go. Um, my name is Kristen O'Reilly. I am a high school special education teacher who works at a New York City Department of Education high school below 60th Street in Manhattan. Um, I'm a homeowner in District 40 in Brooklyn, and um, I too am here to advocate for a 100% exemption to the tolling program for motorcycles. Um, I commute to work on my motorcycle. Uh, this is a um, fuel efficient, cost effective, um, affordable way to commute. Um, I also take the subway, but riding my motorcycle provides me with an opportunity to physical distance, um, get fresh air, enjoy my commute, reduce my commute time, um, and stop at local businesses uh, along my route to and from work in order to um, spend money um, to support New York City's economy. Uh, motorcycles, uh, motorcycle um, tolling exemptions exist in major cities throughout the world. Um, if London can do it, we can do it too. That's it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be John Cho, followed by Timothy Gales. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is John Cho. I'm a resident of Queens, New York, where I've lived for more than two decades. I'm also executive director of the Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce, the only multicultural membership association representing the fourth largest business district in New York. The MTA must implement a robust congestion pricing program in New York City as quickly as possible. Not only will congestion pricing support regional sustainable development by reducing car congestion and pollution, but also help save a vital transportation system relied on by millions of people, including the local residents and small business owners of Flushing. Flushing is one of the largest intermodal transportation hubs in New York, and our business community depends on fast, reliable, transit options for our customers and workers, as well as the delivery of goods and services across our region. Unfortunately, the lack of public investment has made our transit system an impediment, not a facilitator for economic development. The two dozen bus routes that go through our community are some of the slowest in the city, and the seven train has become reliably unreliable. We must fix the system now. Further delay will not only increase the cost of future maintenance and upgrades, but will have a catastrophic impact on our small business owners who have suffered uh, during the pandemic, not only during the lockdown, but also from acts of anti-Asian violence. We urge the MTA to double the planned rate charges for the proposed congestion pricing program. Increasing the rate charges would not only help fund the MTA capital plan, but also provide an opportunity to reduce or even eliminate the fare for subway and bus riders. A reduction or elimination of the fare would help jumpstart ridership on the MTA system, which went into a death spiral during the pandemic. As a predominantly immigrant working class community of color, often overlooked by policymakers, Flushing would benefit from a no fare subway and bus system, which would further the cause of environmental justice throughout the region. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Timothy Gills, followed by Lula Flay. Timothy? My name is Timothy Gillis, president of the Park Slope Civic Council, which was formed in 1896 and is one of the oldest civic associations in the entire city. Many members of the council and of our board of trustees own cars, including my wife and I. You might think this would lead us, based in an outer borough, to oppose congestion pricing, but you would be wrong. In June 2007, when the idea was first discussed seriously, the Civic Council went on record in favor. On November 1st that year, two members of our Livable Streets Committee, Michael Carroll, who went on to become our president, and Lori Schindler, who remains a key leader on our board of trustees, testified at a public hearing held by the Congestion Mitigation Commission. Their testimony in favor of congestion pricing was thoughtful and compelling, and I would like to submit it for the record in this hearing. They argued that congestion pricing would benefit the entire city by unclogging streets, facilitating freer flow of commerce, creating safer conditions for pedestrians and cyclists, increasing subway and bus ridership, and generating revenue for mass transit. 14 years later, 
those remain highly desirable outcomes. In 2007, they also focused on several issues particular to our Park Slope neighborhood, the severe congestion on 4th Avenue, 8th Avenue, and Flatbush Avenue, and the choke points at Atlantic Terminal in downtown Brooklyn. Without congestion pricing, they said, planned new high-rise construction would make what was already unacceptably congested even worse. And that's exactly what has happened. The Civic Council went on record again in 2015 in support of the Move New York plan. And in 2019, when the state legislature finally took up the issue, we sent a letter to our legislators signed by our then president, Joe Rydell, which I'm also submitting for the record. We recognize that congestion pricing would impact different neighborhoods, different commercial sectors, and different socioeconomic groups in different ways. The MTA and our elected officials should consider mitigation, but only where the need to avoid severe hardship or gross inequity is truly compelling. Congestion pricing needs to happen, and it needs to happen now. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lula Flay, followed by Thomas Proctor. Hi, my name is Lula, and I am a resident of Farakoway, in which I have lived since 1994, which is about 26 years. Public transportation is not viable in my area. The closest public transportation is a mile away. It takes almost two hours to get to Midtown and sometimes three hours if the bridge near Broad Channel on the A train does not work for that day. I believe that residents of Far Rockaway should be, should be given 100% exemption from this congestion price. It takes about, via by car or motorcycle, it takes about 45 minutes an hour, which cuts the, the tr transportation time by by in half. So I believe that we should not be punished as far away residents, which we normally get neglected by MTA. We should not be punished for uh, using our cars or motorcycles in order for us to cut the transportation in half. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Thomas Proctor, followed by Linda Barron. Hi there, uh, my name is Thomas Proctor. Uh, I'm a resident of the South Bronx, one of the poorest areas in our nation. Uh, when I'm talking about congestion pricing, I hear a lot of both political leaders and uh, neighbors of mine who drive who are concerned about their ability to pay this toll. Uh, while I sympathize with that, we have one of the highest rates of asthma here in the South Bronx in the nation, despite the very low rate of driving that exists here. Uh, cars are choking our kids. They're choking us. And I ask that congestion pricing be implemented as soon as possible. The idea that we are delaying congestion pricing for months on end for an environmental review is just <laughs> the, the definition of a, of a Kafkaesque uh, broken bureaucracy. This is the most environmentally necessary intervention that is available to our city. It's gonna discourage the most environmentally damaging form of transportation that's available. It'll free up our roads for the efficient operation of our buses, which have been dropping in ridership consistently for the past few years, provide funds and for repairing our subways. And I hope that we can implement it sooner than the long schedule that's, that's been, been set out. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Linda Buran, followed by Edwin Guerrero. Linda? 
Good evening. My name is Linda Barron. I'm the president of the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify tonight. In the past, our organization has supported congestion pricing, uh, uh, primarily when Sam Schwartz was proposing it. Um, our concerns are uh, the, the money that is collected uh, for congestion pricing, that we see improvement in the outer boroughs on Staten Island. We have limited transportation options. And uh, the goal of this is to get cars off the road. And uh, because of the fact that we don't have a lot of transit options, especially to get into Manhattan, we have express buses, which are very expensive. A lot of people do drive when, because they have no other choice. Uh, the ferry is a free option, but if you're a commercial vehicle, you can't take it over the Staten Island Ferry. One of the things that's very important to us is not being double told. Uh, we have commercial vehicles that spend, you know, sometimes $100 for a, a you know, a two-way trip over the bridge. Uh, if they get told again when they want and into the commercial district, that's going to be a hardship, puts them at a competitive disadvantage. There are other areas of the city that do not have uh, tolls on their bridges. Uh, really, what I'm asking for tonight is equity for Staten Island, for some investment in Staten Island in our transportation options, and just to be treated fairly. I believe that if we want a system that gets cars off the road and investment is made, investment needs to be made throughout the entire city in the outer boroughs as well as Manhattan. And uh, those are the things that are important to us. Us, it just not only for Staten Island, but everybody should be paying their fair share. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Edwin Guero, followed by Jason Anthony. Hi. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Edwin Guero. Um, uh, when uh, when I I was born in, in Coney Island, while the summer season while the summer season is almost over, we need to review the um, the the streets from South Avenue when they have congestion and they and on the between West West A two all the way to Thirty Seventh Street and when. When I see the cars going in and out to from the streets, get congested. Once, and once they have congested, the bus cannot go through to every traffic. I want to know uh, to to review the, the the congestion pricing in Coney Island. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Jason Anthony, followed by Vittorio Bugatti. Uh, yes, good evening, Jason Anthony from the Amazon Labor Union. Uh, I'm in full support of congestion pricing, but those who live in certain neighborhoods within the central business district totally area have to pay their fair share. And uh, Amazon workers who drive and commute from different areas from the five boroughs in New Jersey uh, will be potentially affected by this. And don't forget, Jeff Bezos has a penthouse within the, the central business district polling area. And also consider having a gas tax like New Jersey is doing to benefit New Jersey Transit. So let's do the correct thing to not only benefit riders, but to benefit uh, drivers. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vittorio Bugatti, followed by Carlos Castel Croak. Victoria? I'm here. We can hear you. 
Good evening, I'm Vittorio Bugatti, leader and founder of the Express Bus Advocacy Group. Like thousands of commuters in my advocacy group, I'm a proud Attleboro, New Yorker, a born and raised Brooklynite, a former Staten Islander, and a current resident of Riverdale. We in my advocacy group live in transit deserts on Staten Island and Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, in dozens of neighborhoods without subways. Our express buses are our subways. If congestion pricing is implemented, the MTA must agree to the following. First, maintain, expand, and improve its express bus service. The original proposed express bus redesigns for the Bronx and Queens had significant cuts to the spans and frequencies of the service, along with the complete elimination of lines such as the QM3 and QM18. Additionally, we must finally have a reliable and affordable transit system. More people are driving because service continues to be unreliable and there are service heights every other year. Canceling express bus service and leaving two hour gaps almost daily cannot continue to be the norm for areas such as Southeast Brooklyn, another large subway desert. It is an oxymoron for the NTA to say that it wants people to leave their cars at home, but simultaneously propose to cut express bus service to dozens of neighborhoods citywide, which have the longest commutes in the country and the least transportation options. Second, the environmental impact study include uh, research about how much tra transit uh, would be needed to accommodate the influx of riders that the system would see, along with the with an implementation time frame for increased services. Anything less is an insult to thousands of out of borough commuters who have historically been underserved by the MTA. Finally, said study must include a mitigation plan to address the potential increase in vehicular uh, congestion in the out of boroughs from suburban commuters trying to avoid the congestion fee. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carlos Castell Croke, followed by Monica Bartley. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Carlos Castell Croke, and I am a lifelong Brooklyn resident, uh, an avid transit and climate advocate, and a representative from the New York League of Conservation Voters. As Hurricane, I as Hurricane Ida barreled through the Northeast earlier this month, it made it one truth abundantly clear. Climate change is no longer a future threat. It is here and we are woefully underprepared. Given this reality, New York must do everything in its power to drastically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and upgrade our infrastructure to become more resilient. Fortunately, New York has already approved a program that will do all this and more, congestion pricing. Congestion pricing will take dirty, polluting cars off of our most congested roads and in turn provide crucial funding to the MTA so that it can make much needed infrastructure upgrades. We cannot drive our way out of this climate crisis. Cars are the number one polluter from New York's transportation sector, contributing 36% of climate pollution as well as air pollution. So incentivizing commuters to get out of their cars and onto public transportation will be a massive step toward the emission reduction targets set far in landmark climate legislation such as the CLCPA. This program is, re is required to raise 1 billion year over year, promising to support 15 billion for the MTA's capital plan, an investment all the more necessary due to lost revenue during the COVID-19 pandemic. This revenue will further help the MTA invest in resilient infrastructure to help protect our vulnerable subways from flooding in a world where storm surge is increasingly common. Congestion in pricing will also make our streets safer, our public transit more reliable and accessible, and expand our system to serve even more New Yorkers. New York needs congestion pricing now to ensure that we are effectively tackling climate, the climate crisis while investing in our critical transit infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Monica Bartley, followed by Jean Majors. Good evening. My name is Monica Bartley, community organizer at the Center for Independence of the Disabled New York. Sydney supports congestion pricing initiative for people entering New York City use, utilizing a motor vehicle. This initiative could generate 15 billion towards funding the MTA capital plan. Many people with disabilities are denied the use of the subway because of inaccessibility. However, Sydney wants to ensure that people with disabilities are not disadvantaged economically by this tax. The MTA must clarify how exemptions to congestion pricing 
will impact specific populations, particularly New Yorkers with disabilities who may be exempt from congestion fees. What groups are captured by the phrase qualifying vehicles transporting people with disabilities? At a minimum, it must include all types of access ride vehicles, office for people with developmental disabilities vehicles, wheelchair accessible cabs, and other private vehicles used to transport people with disabilities. People with disabilities must not be burdened with additional costs needed to rectify the in inaccessibility of the subway system. However, we acknowledge without the funding from congestion pricing, the capital plan is at risk, along with the promised accessibility improvements and ADA compliance for the subway system. To ensure that the MTA delivers on its promise of increased accessibility, we need congestion pricing to begin as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jean Majors, followed by Julie Huntington. Jean? As a reminder for all attendees, there will be a brief transition after you are called to speak. And please make sure that once your screen updates, your camera and microphone are enabled before you begin your remarks. Gene, are you able to unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Gene Majors, and I'm a member of the Riders Alliance, and I live in Jamaica, Queens. I'm voicing my support for implementing congestion pricing, and I have two reasons. The first reason is because it would help our transit system be more accessible and reliable with funding needed for improvements like elevators and bus upgrades. As a senior, I don't drive and can't walk long distances, and I rely on bus and subways to get around. The second reason is climate change. We are a city being more crowded, we have more traffic congestion and gridlock, and the emissions create even more health problems. We all need to breathe, and congestion pricing will create cleaner and healthier air for us all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julie Huntington, followed by Yehuda Pollock. Julie? Hi, uh, one moment. Um, I've got to talk fast, sorry. Um, I didn't realize that my um, script was going to disappear when, um, oh, here we go. My name is Julie Huntington and I'm a Queens resident and a member of Families for Safe Streets. I'm here to speak to the urgent need for congestion pricing in New York City because I know it will reduce crash-related deaths and injuries. A 2018 study by the Tri-State Transportation Committee indicates that congestion pricing can reduce the number of traffic deaths in New York City by 71 and traffic injuries by 17,000 in the first two years of its implementation. What are we waiting for? Traffic violence is a public health crisis. Everyone thinks that they're immune, that it will never happen to them until one day it does. I'm still reeling from the heartbreak of losing my dad to traffic violence in 2019. I live with the pain of his sudden violent and senseless death every day. Here in New York City, we have the chance to lead the way to prevent injuries and deaths by implementing simple cost-effective life-saving solutions. And we have the chance to do this by taking action now. It is also too late for my friend, Bob Bowen, who was killed by a hit and run driver while riding his bike down 2nd Avenue in the Manhattan Central Business District in 2010. <laughs> Two minutes doesn't give me enough time to tell you all about Bob, about my dad, or about the more than 1,800 people who have been killed by traffic violence in New York City since Mayor de Blasio took office in 2014. The devastation of each life lost is cataclysmic and incalculable. 
We know what we need to do pr to protect and preserve human lives on the streets and sidewalks of New York City. This one's a no brainer. It's time to follow the data and implement congestion pricing now with minimal exceptions and without delay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yehuda Pollock, followed by Richard Kazami. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Yuda. I am from Queens. Um, I walk across a on-ramp to the Grand Central Parkway every day to get to the train. Um, it is often an unrelenting flood of cars. I think congestion pricing will, um, it will slow down the amount of cars that it is easier to cross safely because they do not yield pedestrians. Um, it will also uh, free up cars in central business districts so that people will be able to save from vehicle traffic in Manhattan. Um, it'll also reduce, uh, reduce bus travel times so that people get, to get around faster by bus. Um, and it is also, it's also very useful for, uh, for, for, for delivery drivers to get around so that people actually know when uh, things are coming. There are a lot of time sensitive things being covered around New York. Um, I recently worked um, as an intern with a, uh, with a general contractor on a construction site and um, concrete trucks especially um, have, are very time sensitive and uh, being able to know when things are coming saves everyone a lot of time and the fewer exceptions there are for different um, types of people, the fewer cars there will be, the more dependable um, our city's um, delivery system is able to be. And I think the uh, funds that we generate from congestion pricing can easily be used to help improve transit in places like Eastern Queens, where I live, where there is not a lot of very good transit. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Richard Kazami, followed by Max Livingston. Uh, there we go. Can you see me? Yes, we can uh, see I, and hear you. Okay, I don't see you, but okay. All right, uh, this is Richard Kazami. I'm with the Old Astoria Neighborhood Association. And our Astoria neighborhood and Western Queens in general stands to be greatly affected uh, by congestion pricing because some may choose to park their vehicles in our neighborhood and take public transit to and from Manhattan. As a general matter, we are not opposed to congestion pricing to control traffic in Manhattan and to get extra revenue. However, provisions must be made so that the borough's quality of life is not negatively affected. Also extremely important, those who hold New York City disability parking permits must be exempt from these fees. As they, by the nature of disabilities, they do not have a choice to take public transportation. And lastly, local business that utilizes commercial vehicles in the course of their business must either be exempt or pay a flat fee, even if they do have multiple trips. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Max Livingston followed by Yvette Vasquez. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. And now you should be able to see me also. Um, hi, my name is Max. Um, I live in Brooklyn uh, on the border between Prospect and Crown Heights. I'm here today to support congestion pricing. Um, I think we need to get this done quickly um, and as widespread as possible. Uh, cars are a very inefficient way to navigate the largest and probably densest city in the United States. Um, and we need to encourage people to get on bikes, on public transit, buses, subways, ferries, et cetera. Um, cars just take up a lot of space. They're dangerous. They contribute to uh, hundreds of deaths in terms of crashes, as well as pollution. Um, we in New York are going to have a lot of uh, the population who now is suffering from various long-term 
uh, COVID symptoms, which will interact with the pollution um, to cause various um, respiratory ailments. Um, additionally, the entire time I've been alive, I've been hearing about climate, the climate crisis, um, yet we act in this incredibly slow and ineffective way. We need to take decisive and quick action to reduce the amount of driving, to reduce greenhouse gases, and to reduce pollution. Um, the fact that this process has taken years and years and promises to take years more um, is really an embarrassment and, quite frankly, um, is very upsetting to me um, as someone who I think is younger than probably a lot of the people who call into these meetings. Um, that we're being left with an earth that is warmer, that is more polluted. Um, additionally, uh, congestion pricing will decrease traffic um, and help promote uh, funding the MTA to improve service. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yvette Vasquez, followed by Gerald Demers. Hello, my name is Yvette Vasquez, and I live in Parkchester in the Bronx, and I am a woman of color and a frontline worker, and I'm here to support the congestion pricing because the outer boroughs desperately need more investment in their transit system as COVID was able to magnify the need where frontline workers relied heavily on transportation to and from their jobs. And especially in the South Bronx, where we already know that the environmental impact of cars and congestion has caused high asthma rates, some of the highest in the country. If we include some more busways and expand on select bus service, this will help cut down in transportation time for those workers who need to get to Manhattan, as well as improve the environment for those of us who live in the Bronx and help for our future generations so that they don't have such high asthma rates. <clears throat> yep. And that's all, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gerald Demers, followed by Elizabeth Dennis. Gerard? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, um, good evening. My name is Gerard Demers and I'm a frontline worker who works with children with developmental disabilities. Public transportation is my primary way of traveling, including to and from my place of employment. I live in Co-op City in the Northeast Bronx. Co-op City is a large community of primarily working and middle-class people many of whom rely on public transportation. Within Co-op City is a large community of older people and people with disabilities who rely on public tra transportation to do shopping, get to medical appointments, et cetera. Co-op City is not within walking distance to a subway station, so bus service is essential to access the subway system. Approximately a year and a half to two years ago, we were facing a significant cut to our bus service, which we were thankfully able to mostly avert. However, bus service, especially at night and during the weekends, is often sporadic and unreliable. I strongly urge the implementation of congestion pricing to maintain and hopefully improve our public transportation system. And we also advocate that the revenue gained from congestion pricing goes to maintaining and improving our public transportation system. Public transportation is an essential service for many of us who ownership of a vehicle is not a realistic option. Also, we would hopefully have the added benefit of a positive effect on the environment by increasing the use of public transportation and reducing the use of private vehicles. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak about this important issue. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Dennis, followed by Carlos Horn. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Dennis, and I live in Flatbush in Brooklyn. I'm here to speak to the need to implement congestion pricing as quickly as possible with as few exemptions as possible. I, like the vast majority of New Yorkers, walk bike and take public transit to get around the city. 
Driving into Manhattan is not a necessity. It's a choice made by a minority of New Yorkers that negatively affects everyone. Car traffic slows our buses down and sometimes even grinds them to a halt. The western section of the M21 bus is suspended almost every single day due to traffic congestion entering the Holland Tunnel, and it's unacceptable that public transit can't operate because there are too many cars. Congestion also endangers cyclists' lives because it leads to drivers driving through and idling in bike lanes. I don't bike as much as I'd like to, including in downtown and midtown Manhattan, because I feel unsafe on the city's congested streets. Congestion puts pedestrians at risk too, because crosswalks are often blocked. 2021 has already been a record-breaking year for traffic violence and reducing the number of cars on the road would save lives. Cars increase air pollution in our city, which disproportionately affects lower income communities and communities of color. And those same communities would benefit the most from revenue from congestion pricing going towards public transit options. We need congestion pricing now to ensure there is a New York City for decades to come. CBD tolling will directly fund necessary and overdue public transit maintenance and so that it can run smoothly and with less interruption instead of further falling into disrepair. We also need to have congestion pricing because we need to incentivize New Yorkers to choose greener modes of transportation because catastrophic climate events are already here. Fortunately, car owners tend to be wealthier New Yorkers. The cost of owning a car is substantial and they can afford to finally start to pay their fair share. I urge the MTA to implement congestion pricing as quickly as possible and consider no additional exemptions from the tolling scheme to keep it simple and fair and to maximize the positive change it can bring to our city now and for decades to come. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carlos Horn, followed by Aileen Goldstein. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. I don't see where to start my video. There I go, okay. Uh, thank you everyone for calling in and sharing your thoughts. My name is Carlos Horn and I live in bed -Stuy. I'm here to say quite simply that I request that if congestion pricing goes into effect, it only applies during peak hours. During off-peak hours, the citizenry and small businesses should be able to go into the city without a toll. Otherwise, families such as mine and businesses will be hurt. I'll give you one example. During the pandemic, my family and I wanted Krispy Kreme donuts that were free if we got vaccinated. So after getting vaccinated, we drove down to the only Krispy Kreme in town that happens to be downtown. However, if there would have been a toll, then we would not have gone to get our free donut for getting vaccinated. We would have missed out on the delicious Krispy Kreme donuts. Krispy Kreme would have missed out on the foot traffic that they desire, and the city would have had less effective vaccination campaign as a result. So please, only put congestion pricing during peak traffic hours. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eileen Goldstein, followed by John Walker. Eileen? Eileen, if you can please unmute yourself. Our next speaker will be John Walker, followed by Zaire Baptiste. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay. Con my name is John Walker. I'm a resident of Flatbush, Brooklyn. Uh, the congestion pricing, it's a, it's a reasonable concept, but the notion that lower Manhattan is where the worst congestion is, is totally flawed. 
I mean, that's a fantasy that could have only been dreamed up by someone who never leaves Manhattan. The Long Island Expressway is a crawl until you get to the Midtown Tunnel. And then once you get into Manhattan, the streets are pretty easy to drive on. All the other highways, the BQE, the Cross Bronx, they're all parking lots during the day. And the local streets are crammed too. So Manhattan is not where the traffic problems are. But if you keep people out of Manhattan, it's going to make traffic and emissions worse everywhere else. And I'd be really shocked if your study found otherwise. This would not survive a public referendum. It's no surprise. It's been shot down year after year until in a stroke of brilliant salesmanship, our former governor decided to market this as a money source to fix the subway. This is Manhattan-centric ivory tower thinking at its worst. Elitist might be an overused word, but it seems to apply here since the burden is being placed on working people in the other boroughs. And, you know, for a bunch of smart people, you're ignoring the lessons of history, not to mention economics 101, that uh, by thinking that, uh, you know, government central planning can allocate scarce resources better than uh, market forces. That's it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Zaire Baptiste, followed by Bill Bruno. There. Hello, I'm here. Yep. Yes, this is Zaya Baptiste. I'm a, a lifelong resident of, of Brooklyn. And first, I would like to address how the MTA and the other advocacy groups reached out to the constituency to speak on this topic. The usual underrep community is not here. This is filled with groups who spent six figures to make sure that their supporters are present, aware, and vocally supportive of their goal. And most companies in support stand to make revenue, the Lyft, Lime, Ride Shares, and the advocacy groups that receive financial support. So as I reached out to community organizations, I found that very few were aware of these hearings. Um, how are real representatives to become a part of this uh, long-term conversation should be addressed? And I understand the concerns for congestion pricing. I'm not totally against it, but all of this should not be dumped on drivers. Street closings, narrowing of lanes, restaurant seating, ride sharing, and a continuous boom in construction have had the most significant impact on congestion. I've heard quality of life is an issue and the public transit system does not offer improved quality of life. Of life. You could just ask the, the riders and the employees. This talk of driver aggression is not to be attributed to drivers, but society as a whole. And there is also an uptick in bicyclist, pedestrian accidents and fatalities. So it's something to be wholly addressed and not creating an atmosphere that is aggressive and biased just because someone has a car. The, MBA, the, the MTA can't handle an influx of riders now um, what are they going to do when all of these people come back to, to mass transit? Also, the wealthiest sector of people live in the sub 60th Street area. The political influence gets them that tax, but the proposal would allow them to be exempt. Yet the goal is to tax all vehicles because every vehicle on the road, by theory, contributes to congestion. So is this really about congestion, environment or privilege and money? Um, we need some new leadership at the MTA. That's really what, what needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bill Bruno, followed by Ilya Islovich. Hi. Hi, my name is Bill Bruno, Queens resident for 35 years. Two key aspects. First, cars and trucks are one of the major drivers of greenhouse gases. The EPA has found that the transportation sector is now the largest contributor, and more than half of that comes from passenger cars, medium and heavy duty trucks, SUVs, pickup trucks, and minivans. Uh, anything that disincentivizes their use and drives people to mass transit offsets that. The recent storm events we've had, which are just a harbinger of things to come, indicates the urgency of doing this. And I tend to concur with prior statements that 26 months seems too long for this. There's an equity angle as well. Right now, car owners who generate traffic congestions, environmental and traffic delay costs are passing those to society at large. Congestion pricing would place some of that back on the activity that causes these problems. Equity also calls for shifting of resources from cars to mass transit. 
as non-car owners who have to use mass transit are on average less well off than car owners. And in fact, more workers commute by mass transit than by cars. Finally, congestion also harms transit users and that delays bus service. For example, the M21 bus has had its rush hour service suspended on a regular basis at its last few stops for the last several weeks because of car traffic at the Holland Tunnel. The other equity aspects that carve out should be minimized. Every carve out increases the burden on those people who have to pay a higher toll. Every carve out reduces the income from this plan. And the money is key. A report uh, from reInvent Albany says the MTA does not yet have enough money to finance its capital program, a program essential to making more stations ADA accessible and improving transit timeliness. Thank you for your time and for this, this session. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ilya Islovich, followed by Scott Rising. Our next speaker is Scott Rising, followed by Maria Figueredo Furet. Hello. Hi. So please begin your remarks. Yes, I'm Ilya Solevich. I'm a private citizen, and um, I am from Brooklyn. So I am against the program. First, in my belief, increasing tolls won't reduce congestion. Uh, because those who are forced to travel to lower Manhattan every day will still uh, travel regardless of tolls. Second, this program won't decrease the emissions because same amount of cars will travel daily. Read that congestion will be caused in other parts of the city where you don't have to pay tolls, such as Brooklyn Bridge, as an example, as opposed to Hewlett Tunnel, where you have to pay. Third, this program is in violation of fundamental right to travel guaranteed by liberty in quotes, uh, incorporated by 5th and 14th Amendment of U.S. Constitution and Article 1 of U.S. Constitution. MTA is trying to infringe on, the, on this right by forcing people to pay tolls, and I will sue MTA on this, just like I sued the Mayor de Blasio over the vaccine mandate, uh, Executive Order 225 in the Eastern District of New York. Um, Fourth, MTA will also create unequal classes between those who pay full tolls, prices, and those who are exempt. This is violation of 14th Amendment, uh, Equal Protection Clause, and Article 1 of New York State Constitution, which also has Equal Protection Clause. Sixth, uh, I mean, fifth, the prices for Uber and Lyft will increase. Okay. Um, six, um, uh, there will be unequal uh, representation because not everybody knows about this public hearing. And finally, the seventh, MTA is acting in bad faith uh, by imposing uh, tolls to compensate for deficits in this budget due to waste and mismanagement. I think Office of New York State Attorney General should investigate MTA for waste and mismanagement rather than Trump organization. That is all I have. Thank you. Our next speaker is Scott Rising, followed by Maria Figueredo. Through it. Um, hi, my name is Scott Rising. I'm a resident of Queens, New York, and I'm here to tell you that we are already paying for congestion pricing. We are paying for it in our air quality. We are paying for it in traffic fatalities. We are paying for it in slower ambulances and we are paying for it in climate change, which is urgent and it is coming. We need to do everything that we can to urgently pass congestion pricing so that the people who are causing the impact are the ones paying for it. I say this as a car owner. I think that we, some of that money could be used to increase buses and maybe get buses a PR campaign because buses are great and they are, um, a very efficient and wonderful way for people to get around the city. 
And I think that there should be as few exemptions as possible. The more exemptions you make, the less successful the, that this program will be. That means no police officers. That means no residents of Midtown. And in terms of motorcyclists, I think there needs to be a different uh, way to do this where zero emissions motorcyclists pay no, you know, congestion. There are exceptions for them, but if they are emitting, they, they will eventually down the line pay a toll to incentivize people to do zero emission cycling. Um, but this is urgent and we should enact this as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tiffany Fields, followed by Antoinette Davi. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Tiffany Fields and I've lived in all five boroughs um, and traffic has always been a problem. So if you increase tolls and apply taxes, how is it going to stop people from traveling when trains are congested, buses are limited in all boroughs? I live in Brooklyn and I can't find a bus to even get me to the Bronx. Um, it has been four days since I even touched a train because I was afraid of how crowded it will be on the trains after us going through COVID. And I was afraid of even traveling because it's always crowded. Yes, I am 35 years old and this is my first time even receiving a permit because I wanted to get a car so that way I can avoid getting on the train, avoid being on packed buses. Um, I feel as though whatever resources is going to be implemented after this um, conference, we need to apply more services into our communities and apply more um, express buses to be able to help people get around. But if we even have express buses, you still have blockages from construction and, and um, blockages from roadsides and um, so many different stipulations that still will cause traffic. I feel as though it's not about raising the price or putting stipulations on people from traveling. We need to get better services so people can trust the services. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Antoinette Davi, followed by Sal Albanese. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, so uh, I want to start over again. I am a Queens resident and I use a motorized wheelchair full time. I am against congestion pricing because this places an undue burden on people with disabilities. We all know here that the MTA is not fully accessible and accessoride is a joke. At times, due to the fact that the curb cuts in Queens have not been plowed for days, I do require transportation to my employer um, using my accessible car. I have family members who will drop me off and pick me up. This means that if it is $23, I will have to pay $23 both ways to get to and from the city. I also think it is discriminatory against other residents from the other boroughs. Let's say that you have, you're undergoing chemotherapy. You would then have to pay money to get to a Manhattan hospital, such as Sloan Kettering. But if you live in Manhattan and can't use public transportation, you are free to rent a vehicle, use an Uber, and you won't have to pay as much. I'm completely against this. And I do sincerely feel that if you end up passing this, then you should require people who live in Manhattan and rent, own, or lease vehicles should pay a monthly fee if you're going to go ahead and make the rest of us pay fees as well. I think if you do plan to make exceptions, for um, you know, people with disabilities, it shouldn't be just when they're in the vehicles, but when people are coming to pick them up or drop them off. Well, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sal Albanese, followed by Andres Federahida. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Uh, good evening, I'm Sal Albanese. Thank you for allowing the public uh, 
to, uh, to provide you feedback on this important issue. Throughout the years, um, as a former elected officials, I've talked about congestion pricing. I understand the concept behind it, taking cars off the road and improving our environment. As a Staten Islander, I want to continue to stress the importance of toll equity. Staten Islanders are disproportionately impacted by excessive tolls and congestion pricing is no exception. Congestion pricing will disproportionately impact Staten Islanders who commute to the city by car, given the more limited public transportation options available in the borough and the bridge and tunnels throughout the commute. I'm especially concerned for our essential workers. Many essential workers, including firefighters, police officers, doctors, and nurses, commute at all hours to Manhattan on their shifts. Our essential workers have gone through a lot over the last year and a half. Let's not make things more difficult for them. I continue to support an alternative, which I have proposed in the, pla in the past. I support a plan in which Staten Islanders who commute over the Verrazano Bridge and through a carry tunnel are not told additionally when entering the central business district zone. As a matter of fact, Mayor Bloomberg's proposal called for just that, an offset for Staten Islanders. And Sam Schwartz's plan also calls for an offset Staten Islanders. So, so I, I think that's, that's an indication of fairness. Um, we, Staten Islanders continue to pay some of the highest tolls in the, in the nation. The congestion pricing plan must include a mechanism by which Staten Island residents commuting to work are not forced to pay more than their fair share. Thank you and good evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andres Perejita. And before Andres speaks, um, we'd like to apologize to Andres for the technical challenge. We'd like to give you another opportunity to share your comments. Hello, can you hear me now? Hello? Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Okay, great, great. Okay, so I'll repeat my comment. Uh, there were two things that I had a concern about. Uh, the responsibility or the burden of the charges of the um, tunnels and delivery trucks that they bring in that area. And there is an undue hardship for those who actually have an income of 60,000 or, or less. And um, also there would be an issue with uh, businesses who would uh, have to um, take upon the burden. Also, secondly, um, it seems that you're focused on the 60th street and below. And basically, it's not expanded to the five different boroughs. So I see a lot of congestion all over, and as well as in the Bronx and all the other parts of the boroughs. There is congestion, the air quality is poor, and um, the LIE highway is impacted as well. And Central Park, Grand Central Parkway, both north and south, and JFK area is highly congested. And so uh, that should not be just for the 60th street and under, it should be in all its entirety. So that way it would be better managed. And thirdly, um, I had a concern about the uh, listening to the five different boroughs um, the air quality has been impacting us. The quality of life has been reduced. I encourage that you would focus on the other five boroughs as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessime Hannes, followed by Michael Carbonella.
Our next speaker will be Mark Michael Carbonella, followed by Stephanie Hansen. Hello, am I on? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. I'm from Staten Island. Um, Staten Islanders, we get hit no matter what direction we go in just to get off the island. So to get hit again once we get into Manhattan is just cruel and mean. Um, it's like taxation after taxation after taxation. It's completely unconstitutional to be taxing our travel as we have a right to travel wherever we want on any public property, on any public street. You cannot stop us and you cannot charge us and you cannot ask us for our papers, by the way, like you've been doing lately. So everyone. Be blessed. Visit politicalmoron.com and remember that criminals always wind up in jail. Have a great night. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie Hansen, followed by Michael Streeter. Stephanie? Hi, everyone. I'm an eight-year resident of Clinton Hill, Brooklyn, and I've been living in Brooklyn for 16 years. I'm a biker and the mother of a toddler who walks to preschool every day. Due to increased car commuting since the pandemic, the streets of our neighborhood are more congested and filled with more reckless drivers than ever before. Community uh, District 2 already has one of the highest rates of childhood asthma in New York City, even though the majority of the residents in our neighborhood do not own cars. I strongly support congestion pricing and want to urge the MTA to reduce the 16-month environmental assessment process and implement congestion pricing with as few exceptions as possible as soon as possible. We've already been waiting too long for congestion pricing to go into effect. The MTA needs the revenue to improve its infrastructure and make subway and bus improvements that will benefit all New Yorkers. For Brooklynites, congestion pricing will reduce the number of cars driving through Brooklyn to cross the Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Williamsburg bridges and make our streets safer for pedestrians and bikers. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Streeter, followed by Dario Hewitt. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi, my name is Michael Streeter. I'm a Brooklyn resident. Uh, I wanna speak in favor of uh, congestion pricing and uh, against any exemptions. Um, the, the, the way our city treats bus riders is, is unacceptable. Our, our buses ride at a snail's pace. Uh, there's very, very limited service. Uh, our bus riders are the most disrespected, spit on citizens, and how car drivers are given priority over a, a busload of people is uh, it's simply a travesty that needs to be remedied uh, as soon as possible. And uh, funds need to be used to uh, improve bus and subway service. Um, I also want, want to make it very clear there should be no exemptions uh, and definitely not for the NYPD. We pay the members of the NYPD and many other city agencies very, very well. They have very lucrative careers. If they want to drive in, into Manhattan for their work, they can pay. Uh, they and many other city employees and others uh, who are demanding except, exemptions, uh, they already have placards which allow them to park pretty much wherever they want, which has been a, a major contributor to congestion to begin with. Uh, these uh, privileges have been abused long enough, and we do not need to give these highly corrupt parties additional discounts. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dario Hewitt, followed by Abdul Ba. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So I'm mostly here to explain the ramifications the MTA either has failed or refused to observe and care about. The people who can afford to pay any of these fees 
live near the subway or are walking distance from where they work. Most people today buy a car, not for convenience, but necessity. The MCA has filled on many aspects of necessity as a service provider. It's another subject, but moving on. Bottom line is those New Yorkers who need a car for necessities will be impacted the most. Potential money given back later in tax credits will not soften the blow of upfront financial costs. Another effect that this will induce is drastic action that residents feel that they need to take. This can be everything from trying to simply relocate as part of the ongoing exodus that was caused by the pandemic. I'm not here to scrutinize the MCA primarily. I believe my time would be better spent explaining that fish can swim in water or that the sky is generally blue. It's to shed light on what else seems to be ignored that can be a viable solution. Over a year later, people still don't know how to wear a mask. A baby knows how to roll over in a year and can sit up. I find it hard to believe that we can't move any further. Find them. People double park in express bus lanes, find them. Just like, just a simple spot check on the, chain, on the train, there's another fine. It's not fair that us that have to pay a hefty price on insurance, that have to pay for gas, that have to pay for all these factors, have to now go ahead and be even more financially oppressed. Keeping this continuing pattern oh, is going to open up a few of being able to go to another state where revenue will be shared or being- or This concludes your remarks. Thing up. All right, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Abdul Ba, followed by Mohammed Hosan. Our next speaker will be Mohammed Hosan, followed by Katie Hart. Our next speaker will be Katie Hart. Our next speaker will be Aziz Ba. Aziz? I'm here. We can. Yep. Um, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Aziz. I'm a for hire vehicle driver and uh, the organizing director of the Independent Drivers Guild, the IDG. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to testify before you today regarding the uh, Central Business District Tolling Program. The IDG is a nonprofit affiliate of the Machinist Union, and our organization represents over 120,000 drivers across New York State. I'm here to caution you to implore you not to add any additional fees on trips in for hire vehicles, including Uber, Lyft, livery, and taxis. I am asking for a 100% exemption. All drivers were struggling and barely able to make ends meet before the pandemic, and we have been through some even tougher time over the last 18 months and counting. While companies like Amazon thrived in a pandemic, for hire vehicle drivers were suddenly without work. But 
were still on the hook for contractual expenses for vehicle payment and TLC insurance, which often can total up to more than $1,000 per month. And that's before rent and food. To date, FHV trips are still significantly lower than during the pre-pandemic period. That being said, we simply cannot absorb another fee or another tax. Even if it's paid for by the rider, the ultimate impact will be on the driver in lost business and income. For higher vehicle travel, for higher vehicle travel in New York City cannot be seen as, as an untapped source of funding for the state, city, or MTA. This must stop as, it's the only, as it only hurt the working class, poor immigrant communities and drivers. For higher vehicle ride already paid more than their fair share. We have been subjected to the congestion fee since 2019. Where has that money gone? How much been um, uh, MTA has been raising uh, has raised on the congestion program. While we are, we share the all important goal of reducing traffic, improving air quality, and please conclude your remarks. Instead of increasing costs on these drivers or those riders who depend on these services for reliable uh, transportation, we Thank encourage you. to look on other contribution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Katie Hart, followed by Michelle Daunton. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, my name is Katie Hart. I live in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and I am a parent of a child with special needs. My child attends a specialized school on the Upper West Side in Manhattan in order to receive his fair and appropriate education for his learning disabilities. The commute on a bus or public transportation with multiple transfers is far too long for my six-year-old. So which, with much sacrifice to my family, I drive him every day so that he'll be ready to learn at the start of school. And when I pick him up in the afternoon, it allows me to take him to his, his additional therapies um, that are necessary. Um, we've talk, There's been talk about exemptions for people with disabilities. I'm wondering, will this include children like mine who has learning disabilities that travel from outer boroughs into Manhattan in order to receive their fair and appropriate education? And when exactly will a waiver process or exemption process be made public so that my family may apply? Um, who will be the point of contact? Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Michelle Daunton, followed by Jackie Lynn. Michelle? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, hi. Um, I am actually an app-based driver and I also am um, an advocate for the drivers. I oppose this congestion 100%. I believe that drivers should be exempt. We travel across the bridges many different times uh, per day transporting riders. This will be a burden on the drivers. Um, we, have a, um, we are drivers paying MT already two surcharges. First, 275 plus 3.75% on every ride. Why should we then again come and pay another fee to MTA? MTA has not shown us drivers, FHV drivers, any exemptions we cannot use the lanes we cannot use the bike lanes to drop to to if there's only option we can't even pull up to the sidewalk to drop off our passengers the riders are paying to be able to be on the road an mtba so charge but getting zero benefits we're asking that we, if this plan goes in that our drivers are held exempt we are disproportionately immigrant. We actually fall under your rule as of minority for justice um, for the immigrants and environmental justice for minorities. We need to be exempt. We cannot afford to give any MTA any more money and the riders cannot afford this unjust fear. We need uh, the riders to be able to have a 
real say on what happens in this. Please make us exempt. We already are paying a huge fee. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, if you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function with the name you used when you signed up. Due to the large number of speakers, we will be going over our scheduled time this evening, but everyone who signed up will be called to speak today. If you do not wanna to wait to be called, you may send us comments directly or sign up to speak at one of our upcoming webinars. For more details, please visit our website at new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP or feel free to post your comments in the Q&A function on Zoom or call the public meeting hotline at 646-252-6777. The next speaker is Larbi Antabu, followed by Lucy Cotin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry, I failed to call your name. The next speaker is Jackie Lynn. All right. Um, so, yes. So uh, my name is Jackie. I'm actually part of the Independent Drivers Guild. So uh, what I want to say is that drivers in the FHV industry should be uh, exempted from congestion pricing. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because, you know, if you want any uh, if you want any congestion pricing money, I think you should be targeting the app companies. Right. The app companies, they have the resources, not the drivers that have these kind of resources uh, available to pay for these. Uh, and not only that, you know, who are the ones that are requesting the rides in these areas? And that will be the riders. So, you know, as a matter of fact, FHV cars, those that drive for Uber and Lyft, we are already paying these, um, the congestion pricing. Uh, you know, anywhere below, I believe 96th Street, they are paying 275 on top of the fare. Uh, which is something that is just the MTA, uh, like a regular subway ride. Um, and not only that, but also New York City TLC rule states that you cannot overcharge a customer, right? So, you know, being that it was always being congested, riders are always being overcharged, but that is not the driver's fault. Uh, you know, we should be able to have an easier way for drivers to send the passengers to where they have to go. Uh, you know, on the left side of Manhattan, there's always an each street, right? there's always a bike lane. On the right side, sometimes it's one lane, sometimes it's two lanes, and those are bus lanes. And those bus lanes, they take up a lot of space. Are they always being utilized? No. I'm not saying, hey, don't give these bus lanes priority, but let us use it too. That, would, that way we could get our riders there much faster. Uh, and also, if you were to exempt anybody, uh, you know, like, or, or like, you know, or, or someone to, to, to go after cyclists and and, and, and motorcyclists, right? The reason why I say that is because they are danger to the road. They don't follow the rules of the road. And that is against Vision Zero. Please conclude your remarks. Vision Zero is something that we want to push for, for the safety of everybody, right? Everybody have to follow the rules. And last but not least, before I finish, you, you know, I believe that we should have. Our next speaker is Larbi Aitabu, followed by Lucy Cotin. All right, so I think uh, everybody can hear me right now. Yes, we can. All right, uh, excellent. I've here, I've heard a lot of uh, uh, commentary here talking about congestion. And the reality of things is that only a minority being attacked and only a minority being targeted uh, in this model uh, or in this tolling program. Uh, I've been a driver for over 17 years. Uh, and uh, when I drove a yellow cab before and I was paying the MTA, and I heard that I was paying the MTA. I didn't understand why I was paying the MTA. Yeah, fixing the infrastructure. I'm also a user of, of, uh, of, of the MTA services, uh, which sometimes, or most of the time, were not reliable. However, uh, coming to uh, creating this model right here and having people like me, a driver, that rely on every penny, uh, not, not to mention the loss that we have every day, uh, either getting targeted by the NYPD or the TLC fines. Uh, that's another financial burden that the drivers have to carry. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't mention my, um, my name, but my name is Larbi Aitabu, I'm uh, a driver here in New York City. 
uh, and also an advocate for all the drivers community, taxi drivers, uh, black car drivers. Um, one thing that I just wanna mention right here that this program uh, will uh, put people uh, lives in jeopardy and it will hurt a lot of drivers pocket. Think about it, uh, reform it and, and exempt the drivers completely from this tolling because they are what? They are the one that moves New York City. Uh, they are one that moves the essential workers, doctors, lawyers, uh, uh, nurses. Uh, during the pandemic, who was carrying all these people? The taxi drivers, the FHV drivers, the one that were uh, carrying those people, not the MTA. Uh, and, and I thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lucy Coteen, followed by Mohammed Hossein. Lucy? Lucy, if you're able to unmute yourself, you can begin your remarks. Hello? We can hear you. Oh, okay, sorry, it took a minute. Uh, good evening, my name's Lucy Cochin and I have a few points to make. I, I do oppose the congestion pricing plan. The people who will be hurt the most are the working class people who have no choice but to take a car into the area. Many are the workers who have to carry tools and equipment to do their job and essential workers who work at odd hours. Two, to create the idea that one part of the city is more precious than other parts of the city and that we have to pay extra to enter there with a car, but not into other areas. Manhattan becomes a shiny city on the hill that we have to pay to enter. If you live in the pricing area and use a car, you have to pay an extra tax just to return to your home. Four, there are more equitable ways to raise money, such as by taxing the wealthy, such as an increase in capital gains and money made in the stock market, which is not earned money, and dedicated to the MTA. How about asking Jeff Bezos to give back a couple of billion that he made off of New Yorkers and for clogging our streets with Amazon trucks and Amazon garbage? Seriously, he will make it back in an hour or two. And the other billionaires like Bloomberg who made billions off of New York City residents. Charging 23 to $35 in a, is an outrageous amount of money and businesses will pass these costs on to their customers who are already the taxpayers that keep the city going. People who drive from, from the outer boroughs often have no choice but to drive due to lack of public transportation near to them or because they have a disability that does not allow for them to take public transportation. The subways are not available to many people who are unable to manage stairs. It will hurt tourist areas like Chinatown and Broadway shows and other entertainment venues. People drive in from outside the city and are fearful to take public transportation. Many of the hospitals and doctor's offices are below 60th Street and people often need to be driven to appointments or to the Please hospital. Please conclude your remarks. These can be multiple trips. It is not a choice they have. And one other thing, um, uh, the city Thank can you. change. Our next speaker is Mohammed Hossein, followed by Daniel Solo. Mohammed. Yes. Good evening. So my name is Mohammed Hossein. I'm an immigrant from Bangladesh, um, working in New York City since uh, 2015 as a FSB driver. Started my career with. I saw that every single step is uh, the FSB driver are negligent and the sufferer. So as a um, worker, as a um, like. Uh, what can I say? Like, uh, okay, like as a driver, I realized that 
everything is a pressurized to the FSB driver, all things that go to against to the drivers. So I'm totally um, against to this congestion price. I'm representing to the driver's cooperative. I'm also the member of the driver's cooperative. So my view is the planner, please think about the other way. Don't think to pressurize the 100,000 driver's family. Is a New York City is a four five hundred years ago the same way the million of people are increasing? What do you do? Think about how can you make a double routes, overpass, make a new routes. That is not the duty to uh, planning every day to the searchers. I'm suggesting to the everyone lower the tolls five dollar in a town like the Manhattan Queens like and ten dollar for the other big bridges. You know the tunnels. So that is the my proposal, and I'm requesting to the panelists, everyone, uh, don't think about the increase the price, increase those who are business people. Those are million, billion dollars, not think about the simple taxi drivers. So I think so the panelists will uh, think about that, the planner will think about that uh, to make, because um, my other folks are also mentioned, we keep New York City alive in the pandemic times, no other than. So think about the taxi driver, 100,000 family members. And thank you everyone for listening to me. Thanks again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniel Solo, followed by Roberta Cooperman. Uh, hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes, we can. Okay, hold on, I just need to minimize my screen. All right. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Solo, and I'm calling from Parker Towers in Forest Hills, Queens. I'm calling you tonight to express my full support for the Central Business District tolling uh, program, also known as congestion pricing. Uh, with Hurricane Ida in the rearview mirror and a summer that we've experienced uh, oppressive heat, we need to be really serious about the threat of climate change and the repercussions of our municipal and personal transportation decisions. We cannot wait a full year and a half for statistical models and experts to tell us what we already know. Our love affair with cars is killing us. Uh, thanks to the leadership of our activist community and forward thinking politicians, New York has become a much safer place for my wife and I to navigate city streets on foot, bike and public transportation. Uh, I don't need a car to do most things, and most New Yorkers don't even own cars. However, our subway is failing us today. Much of the subway signal technology is over 90 years old, and the sub, the tunnels rehabilitation uh, delays are costing us time and money, all the repairs. So millions of New Yorkers rely on the subway every day, including those on the front lines who uh, were fighting for us in this pandemic. The subway is what makes New York so special, and it deserves these capital investments that will help us compete with other metropolitan areas. In closing, implementing congestion pricing is good for our lungs, our most vulnerable New Yorkers, and frankly, other cities are looking at us to take the first step. Across the pond, Lon uh, London and, uh, and other cities in Europe have shown decreases in air pollution and improved transportation. New York, let's show the rest of North America that we are serious about tackling climate change. And Please conclude your remarks. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roberta Cooperman, followed by William Schimoller. Roberta? Roberta, if you unmute yourself, you can begin your remarks. My name is Roberta Cooperman, and I represent people with physical challenges. I agree with the concept that people should be encouraged to take mass transit, which is better for the environment. You state that this tax won't apply to people with disabilities. However, I will give you three scenarios in which taping, taking public transportation is impossible and this fee absolutely discriminates against group of people, groups of people with either temporary 
physical challenges or visitors to New York with physical challenges. One, I am 69 years old, retired and broke my tibia. I do not have a handicap permit for my car. It takes months to receive one. My doctor's appointments are in Manhattan. It is just wrong that I would have to incur a $23 tax to see my doctor. Two, I just finished 15 months of chemotherapy. My treatments were in Manhattan. During this time, my husband needed two surgeries in Manhattan. People had to drive us. Again, no one has handicap permits. We are sick and barely have energy to do minimal tasks. Three, my 93-year-old mother would visit from Florida. I always like to take her to visit Manhattan. She has a handicap permit in Florida since she has a heart condition. She needs to get dropped off close to her destination. Why are you penalizing her for her age and her handicap? During the bottom line, there are many reasons why people who would prefer to use mass transit and not deal with traffic and help the environment are just not physically able to. You need to figure out a way to address the above population in an equitable, non-discriminatory manner. I believe it's healthy people who write these laws without a clue about the impact on people with physical challenges. We need to be taken into account. One day, this might be you. Thank you. The next speaker is William Schimoller, followed by Sebastian Quinn. William? William Schimmler? William, if you're able to unmute yourself, you can begin your remarks. While we work to resolve that, we will move to Sebastian Quinn. Hi everybody, it's a little dark where I am here, so I'm gonna keep my camera off. Um, my name is Sebastian Quinn, I'm a resident of Brooklyn. Um, I don't think it's a surprise that everyone here is opposed to congestion and pollution and traffic and global warming, of course, we're all opposed to all of these things. Well, what we need to keep an eye on here is where is this money going? Where is this money going, this new money, this new tax, this new fee? And if the past is any guide, all we have to do is look at the uh, New York Times article, uh, December 28, 2017, titled The Most Expensive Mile of Track on Earth. This article uh, documents the fact that equivalent infrastructure in New York costs five times as much to build as it does in Los Angeles, London, or Paris. And that's because the MTA consistently with this capital improvement budget, spends 80 cents of every dollar on waste, fraud, and abuse, and gives us only 20 cents worth of value for every dollar we spend. And there's no indication in anything that's been spoken about this plan that this is going to be any different. So the question on the table right now is really absurd. The question is, how much more waste, fraud, and abuse would you like to pay for it? Would you like a $25 waste, fraud, and abuse charge or a $10 waste, fraud, and abuse charge? It's absolutely absurd. Until the MTA is able to patch this giant hole in the bottom of its bucket, its monetary bucket, it doesn't make any more sense to put any more money into this bucket. 
It's a waste of New Yorkers hard earned money. And New York is never going to have the infrastructure it deserves as long as the MTA continues to waste 80% of its capital budget. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Our next speaker is Zach Miller, followed by Renee Luciano. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. My name is Zach Miller. I am a lifelong Queens resident and proud member of the trucking industry. When COVID-19 was at its worst, trucking was at its best, keeping our economy moving forward every day by safely ensuring grocery shelves were stocked, hospital and pharmacies were supplied, and businesses were able to stay afloat as work and consumer needs shifted overnight. And how does New York City look to thank this industry for their her wor heroic work? by taxing them, of course. This is curious for a few reasons. Firstly, because trucks make deliveries based on consumer and business demand, not because they want to cruise around midtown Manhattan for fun. There is no mass transit option. I live five minutes from the F train, and I assure you, the F doesn't stand for freight. A tax to encourage mass transit use is utterly irrelevant for commercial freight. Secondly, and this is not directed at the MTA, but at those who support congestion pricing on the notion that trucks don't pay their fair share, are you kidding me? At Port Authority Bridges and Tolls, trucks currently pay up to $132, depending on vehicle size. At the MTA Bridges and Tunnels, that cost uh, maxes out at about $79 per trip, depending on size. Then there's New York State's highway use tax. Then there's the IFTA, International Fuel Tax, which is a portion based on miles traveled within New York State, and the IRP, the International Registration Plan. Of course, there are fuel taxes collected at each fill-up. Much of that money is supposed to be dedicated to improving and maintaining highway infrastructure, but is regularly rated by elected officials for other programs. In New York City, there's a commercial vehicle tax, which imposes up to $300 annual fee on each commercial vehicle. And we can't forget about the parking tickets, which bring in over half a billion dollars annually to New York City, as well as the absurd citizen, citizen engine idling tickets that only apply to commercial vehicles. The trucking industry in total pays about $1.2 in federal and state road rate taxes. Truckers pay about 35% of all taxes paid by New York motorists, even though trucks only drive about 7% of the total miles traveled. The typical five-axle five axle tractor trailer pays over $21,000 user fees and taxes. These figures are about above the general business fees paid in New York. Charging trucks a congestion Thank fee you. is insulting, absurd, and short-sighted. Thank you. Our next speaker is Renee Luciano, followed by William Schimoller. And as a reminder, there will be a brief transition after your call to speak. Please make sure that once your screen updates, your camera and microphone are enabled before you begin your remarks. Renee? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I want to speak on this issue from two perspectives, actually, both as a motorist from the outer boroughs and as a commercial vehicle driver myself. Now, as a motorist, I feel it's just another unfair assault on the middle class or just another way to charge us for the luxury of driving into New York City. The idea that local motorists are rich elites is laughable. There are many motorists who need to have a car due to the fact that more than half of the neighborhoods in New York City are transit deserts. It may take the MTA another 100 years to address this issue via your capital plan. Now, this congestion pricing plan puts no money into roads or bridges, and 100% of the revenue goes back into the transit system. So an outer borough resident like myself, who lives in the Bronx, must fund a transit system that I cannot easily access. Now, speaking as someone who has earned a living driving trucks in New York. This congestion pricing plan is gonna put a strain on hardworking middle-class New Yorkers who have earned their living in the industry. The average New York City truck driver looks like myself and is a hardworking taxpayer, and we overwhelmingly come from the black and Latino communities. Some of us even own our own trucks and the routes that we operate. Now the unintended consequences of adding additional charges to the transportation industry will negatively impact our communities, jobs, and the tightrope profit margins we already operate within. Now imagine, as an industry, we have already been spending and spread thin throughout the pandemic because as frontline workers in transportation, we kept the supply chain going. I also don't see any of this money going into improving 
transit development or equity for our communities who bore a disproportionate brunt of the impact during the pandemic. If this plan goes into effect, it's gonna have a ripple effect into the price of everything, increase any of the items that gets delivered from a truck in that zone and throughout the city. The industry can absorb another cost from this benefit. Um, according to the meeting, we still don't know, according to this public meeting, we still don't know how the prices are gonna look for trucks, who the board members are making the decisions, and if we truly are gonna benefit from easing congestion. Thank you. The next speaker is William Schmoller, followed by Matthew Morgan. Good evening, my name is Bill Schimmler and I am thoroughly in support of congestion pricing. My first exposure to, to this uh, arrangement was in Singapore in the mid 1980s. Subsequent to that in the early 2000s, I became familiar with it in London. And in both instances, it seems to me to work very, very successfully. Clearly, the uh, case in Singapore has been going on for decades now, and everyone there seems to support it. So I'm delighted to see that New York City is finally coming into the 21st century and adopting mechanics and pricing that will enhance our public transportation and support everybody's support. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matthew Morgan followed by Margaret Michael John Pasley. Hello. We can as, hear the popular, as the popular sound on TikTok goes, well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of my own actions. We are here tonight due to decades of MTA mismanagement. MTA mismanagement and corruption. Instead of spending money on improving mass transit, MTA neglected their duties and used their budget as a piggy bank for vanity projects for Cuomo to cover up for his deep-seated insecurities stemming from his relationship with his father. But I digress. We should build a city that is less polluted by motor vehicles, but in order to do that, we need to create a superior alternative to get people out of their cars. We can't force people out with tolls. But sadly, MTA has backed itself into a corner. We need an alternative that recognizes climate change as a serious threat and seeks to move people where they want to go efficiently, economically, and in mass. That means subways, buses, and bikes. There needs to be an ironclad guarantee that this toll money will go towards improving mass transit and not just enriching the MTA coffers. At least when Uber and Lyft blow billions of dollars, they provide a great service and a good price. MTA blows billions and provides a subpar, unreliable service. It has to stop. We need to get serious about improving transit because we face an environmental crisis. And it is also flat out embarrassing to see the second tier cities around the world who have it better than the best city on earth does when it comes to mass transit. I'm not speaking against or in favor of the tolls, but rather pointed out the obvious that if you want less cars, build cities based around people that provides better alternatives for transportation to cars. Please consider this testimony as the official statement of the Brooklyn Libertarian Party. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Margaret Mickeljohn Pasley, followed by Charles Sturkin. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Margaret Pasley Michael John. Can you hear, hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. I um I am not in favor. I because I do believe that the MTA can do much better than what they're doing. Increasing the congestive prices is not for us. As a home care worker, it does not look good on our side you know and i think i'm speaking for all home care workers right because we don't make a lot of money and um for those of us who have to use to drive into work 
into these five different boroughs and those of us who have to um, go through Manhattan, it's a pain in the neck, you know, when there is traffic. So I do think an MTA can do much, much better, you know, because most of the money that is that MTA made is going into their administration pocket. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next speaker is Charles Sturkin, followed by Elizabeth Tavares Rivera. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inv inviting the public here. Okay, my name is Charles Sturkin. I live in Manhattan and I live within the uh, 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 district that uh, you're trying to regulate. So um, just one, before I read my statement, and I'll, I'll, I'll be within the time frame. Um, I think your statistics are wrong about the number of people who live below 60th Street. It might've been based on 2010, but 2020, there's about 60,000 more in that slide you presented. My statement. The MTA uh, congestion pricing plan should adopt a rebate system for residents who live below 60th Street in Manhattan, who will be unfairly burdened, or should I say taxed, because they own a car. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, uh, the state legislature enacted a rebate program in their budget adoption a few years ago for Queens residents who used the Cross Bay Bridge to traverse to and from Rockaway section of Queens. Stacey Amato alluded to that before in her presentation. The rationale at the time was that no other residents in the city get charged for moving around within their own borough. This rationale is just as valid today in this plan to charge Manhattan residents who own a car for moving around their borough. All Manhattan legislators voted for the Queens rebate in the budget adoption. The six community boards that are mapped below 60th Street account for approximately 40% of Manhattan's 1.7 million residents based on the 2020 census. According to the Economic Development Corporation, 22% of Manhattan households own and drive cars. The MTA, MTA needs to rethink the plan to impose an extra burden on those Manhattan communities and their residents who will be Please conclude your remarks. disproportionately paying for MTA capital programs, while mega corporations like UPS, Amazon, FedEx, Thank you. Have the district with thousands. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Tavares Rivera, followed by Anwar Malik. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, mm, I am a native New Yorker and I'm opposed to the congestion pricing and I live in Manhattan. While I wanna see a reduction in greenhouse gases, placing a toll on the populace is not necessary. We need to explore other ways to reduce emissions without an additional cost on the average person. Mismanagement of funds by the MTA, even though fares continue to increase while services um, have been reduced, not to mention the general lack of accessibility in public transportation, calls into question the fact that we're gonna give this entity additional funding. Most of the people who drive in, do not live in New York City. We have people who come from other areas, including Westchester and New Jersey. Most New Yorkers use public transportation even when they own a car, unless they're going to a doctor's appointment, especially in this area where there's no parking and fees to park in a garage are exorbitant. This will add another cost to people who are suffering illnesses and people with disabilities. Only the rich are going to be able to enjoy the benefits of traveling via vehicles and the exemption from paying the tax. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Anwar Malik, followed by Tina Ravenu. Hi. Hello, my name is Anwar Malik from Long Island and I am a driver out in the city. That was a 30 minute. <laughs> okay, so drivers with passengers barely make $100 with a 12 hour shift. And here MTA is trying to get more money out of them. Drivers have made everyone rich except themselves. And I believe putting more tolls on them is complete nonsense. The proposed plan 
is what I call robbing a rideshare or a taxi driver and still not giving them any protection. Drivers are dying out there, getting shot, robbed, killed. No one cares. No one's giving a damn about it. Drivers already get MTA, already give MTA a congestion price and still aren't allowed to, allowed to use a bus lane. How is that fair? The congestion won't stop because the trucks will still double park and create traffic. So the real solution is don't let trucks go there and create more jobs, you know, with bikes and stuff. Going after rideshare drivers is not a solution. Last but not least, if MTA needs money, we can only start a GoFundMe for you guys. That's it. Thank you. The next speaker is Tina Ravenu, followed by Pedro Acosta. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening. My name is Tina Ravino. I'm a Brooklyn resident, a rideshare driver, and a driver advocate. Rideshare workers are already paying their fair share. $2.75 on rideshare trips, a, a 888 75 sale tax of which 0.375% is already going to MTA. Another seven or $10 or more will just further take us into poverty and that cannot happen. Minority workers should not be held accountable for funding the MTA poor infrastructure. The MTA has been rising the fares for residents long before the right share industry came into play. And still commuters have not seen any major changes in the last 20 years, except for a few new buses and bike lanes and, 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 and bus lanes that we rideshare drivers should have access to. In New York, we should have learned that if you increase fares on one thing, you shift the problem to something else, like reducing ridership to rideshare drivers. This will affect our daily take home income. Don't punish hardworking rideshare workers because of your negligence to provide good service to communities. Let's not forget, it was rideshare, it was rideshare drivers and taxi workers rising, risking their lives to transport essential workers. Don't forget that. We also saw that New York, in New York two years ago, many MTA executives got million dollar bonuses. MTA has money. They're just using it lavishly. 100% exemption for all rideshare workers. You could fix this, do better. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pedro Acosta, followed by, followed by Thomas Lajudais. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, my name is Pedro Acosta and I am a Brooklyn resident and I'm also a ride share driver and advocating for all the ride share, I mean, all the FHB drivers. Uh, I am totally opposed to this um, new uh, tax congestion because that's going to affect us so much. We have been already, I mean, we are now paying a lot of taxes. We pay $456 down for a registration when a regular per person just pay 120 every two years. And we pay this every year. We pay from $4,000 to $8,000 insurance. We pay three times inspection for our vehicles every year. We pay $225 at the airport. Uh, that's another tax. We pay $275 from the midtown and below uh, tax congestion already. And um, also we pay $2.90 black car fund. We are not able to use, I mean, we get every now and then we get tickets because uh, because of the bus lane and bike lanes. Um, sometimes, I mean, you are charging us for the accident that is happening with the bike lane, with the bike guy, I mean. But the thing is that they are, they are just driving or they are biking like the organized. They are, not, they are not putting attention to the regulation and they keep interrupting in our lanes. So we are totally opposed to this. And I think that to prevent the traffic, trucks should do the delivery at night time. That will help a lot. Thank you so much. And also, this is gonna complicate life of people with disability because we driver are not gonna be happy like spending money buying a wheelchair vehicle because we have so much things to pay. So that's gonna make even worse for a wheelchair user. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Our final two speakers are Thomas LaJudice and Iris Smith. If you are signed up to speak but have not heard your name called, please indicate this in the Q&A function. The next speaker is Thomas LaJudice. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And my name is Thomas M. Lagaitis. I'm the former chairman of the Traffic and Transportation of Community Board 3 in Staten Island. Unfortunately, Staten Island is the most overtaxed by the MTA. We, we, we wind, if you want to go to Manhattan, you wind up paying $13 in tolls. While well, people in Queens only have to pay $1.60. Staten Island has no subway. We have less public transportation in Staten Island than we did in 1953. It is ridiculous to put another, another surcharge on us to go to Manhattan. I suffer from cancer. I'm already paying $13 to go into, if I, if I have to go in to get my treatment at NYU, additional paying parking and paying an 18% 18, 18 tax on top of my parking. We have no public transportation in Staten Island. 60% of Staten Islanders have no public transportation within a half mile radius. If you are gonna do put this taxation plan in effect, there has to be a 100% rebate for any tolls, both in the Verrazano and the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Iris Smith, followed by Lauren Shapiro. Iris? Um, yes, good evening. My name is Iris Smith. I'm a frontline worker. I live in Brooklyn. I support congestion pricing. Um, this has been an unhealthy commute, um, particularly for the healthcare, which is one of the fastest growing industries. Um, as a healthcare work worker, um, as a health home aide, sometimes I care for clients that have difficulties going up the steps, so this is personal to me. The MTA can use congestion pricing for subway stations that do not have adequate or accommodate accessibilities for the seniors, the disabled, and mothers with strollers by building ramps, escalators, and elevators in the outer subway stations out of borough subway station. Um, it also states that the Traffic Mobility Act states that they must have an exemption for families making less than $60,000. Um, I support the suggestion, uh, suggestion uh, congestion pricing. Um, I feel that in Brooklyn, we need double busing, um, that they should not have to they should be exempt, especially in remote places that's located in Brooklyn, Staten Island, and Queens. And thank you for allowing me to speak. Good evening. Thank you. Our next, our next speaker is Lauren Shapiro, followed by Joseph Berry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I am opposed to congestion pricing. The city ha is shifting the burden to the public for not doing its job. The city has done nothing to alleviate congestion. There could be staggered hours. All city agencies could work on the weekends and not be open on Mondays and Fridays, they could shift their hours to 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. This would be better for the public that they serve. City courts, the libraries, um, the marriage bureau, all kinds of licensing agencies could be working on the weekends and um, staggered hours. That would greatly relieve congestion. Also, the city has caused congestion with bike lanes 
that are never used or rarely used and by bus lanes that are used every 15 minutes. Um, and then they turn around and say, there's congestion. Um, Central Park has nine bike lanes and somehow that's just not enough and take away um, the entire length of Central Park West for bikers, um, which causes more congestion. And um, I don't think that the Department of Transportation has seen whether or not those um, lanes are in use. They're certainly not in use from November through April, and they're hardly in use before that. Um, so I think until the city takes steps to make some efforts to alleviate congestion, they can't turn around and shift the burden to the public. Thank you. The next speaker is Joseph Berry, followed by Jose Taveras. If you're signed up to speak but have not heard your name called, please indicate this in the Q&A function. Joseph Berry? All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, I wanna start off with my full opposition to congestion pricing. Like thousands of other people in New York, I work a regular part-time job, I'm a high school student, and taking public transportation will take 50% longer than electric cycling and more than twice as longer than someone driving me. I don't got the time or willingness to stand idle at cold of bus stops and during commute that contains two buses and a slow subway, simply because of my family's economic standing. Every day New Yorkers will be ripped off at this plan, especially those who are already paying the tolls. As it looks, we will be charging trucks who already pay premium to make essential deliveries and rising the cost of everyday goods. You will also be charging probably electric vehicles or motorcyclists who are more environmentally cleaner and take up less space on the road. This plan is utter sick. Guess who lobbied for this? The rich and elite, the CEOs of Uber and Lyft themselves who already got exemptions for their own companies. The wealthy Manhattanites are also all in for this. This is a pocket change for them as they reap the benefits of the government forcing citizens to haul kids and the disabled in parcels on tightly packed subway cars. And the argument that the MTA is underfunded is a load of garbage. You got $10 billion from the feds found ways to build the most expensive subway in the world, spend $1.6 billion on a rail station in midtown Manhattan, and you have almost half of your operating expenses covered by dedicated tax revenues. Along this charge, people commuting north to 60th Street will take alternate routes, clogging the I-278 and highways on the east and west side. We don't need more congestions for deliveries that, that carry foods and medicines, and all of it is taking longer and longer. None of this money will go back to road users and will not and will not fix issues like the Brooklyn Queens Expressway or the crumbling infrastructure in New York City. I love New York City, not the radical parties and corrupt agencies like the MTA that run it. Thank and you. that's it. <sighs> Our final speaker will be Jose Tavares. Jose? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the NTA, to begin, they, from what I heard, is that they do not open their books, their financial books, to the state, which is very responsible. I work in the ride share business. And when I pick up somebody below 96th Street, they pay a fare to the NTA. If I'm dropping off somebody, Below 96th Street, that person pay a fare to the MTA. And if I pick up somebody below 96th Street and take them to the airport, that person, once they sit in my car, they pay for an MTA fare. And when I drop them off at the airport, they pay for another MTA fare. This is irresponsible for the MTA to keep on asking us to funding um, the MTA. And not only that, but it's on the news, it comes out on the news where they actually, a lot of employees from the MTA get arrested because they taking bribe. 
that is so irresponsible. I hope they fix the book. Just fix it. They know how to fix the book, the financial books. So I hope they do that. Thank you. And I oppose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. For those who did not do so already, we encourage you to take our short survey via the QR code or link currently being displayed. The link can also be found in the Q&A section of the Zoom. For details about upcoming webinars and how to sign up to speak at them, please visit new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP or by calling the public meeting hotline at 646-252-6777. As a final reminder, in addition to the virtual public webinars, there are several other ways you can provide comments, ask questions, or make requests. We encourage the public to comment via the CBDTP website, new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP. You may also email comments to CBDTP at mtabt.org, send them via mail to CBD Tolling Program, 2 Broadway, 23rd Floor, New York, New York, 10004, or call 646 252 7440. The time is currently 8.54 p.m. This concludes our webinar. Thank you again for your participation.